continue on of the uh, uh, word of the Buddha, translation from the Pali. And just to recap on some important points from yesterday, this is Ajahn Brahm's translation of the word of the Buddha, a uh, group of suttas, key suttas, key teachings of the Buddha formed around the theme of the Eightfold Path and Four Noble Truths. Basically, it's just central uh, Buddhism. And also that it is my translation, every monk will have their own little idiosyncrasies of the translation. But the one thing which I was encouraging is to make sure you translate sentences, not words. Because the word is used in different meanings, in different contexts. And the example which I often give, simply because being in Thailand for so many years, nine years, being fluent in Thai now, and then people would come up to me and they were ties and say, what on earth does this mean? It was raining cats and dogs. <laughs> does that mean that when it has a storm in London that cats fall from the sky? <laughs> and it's a good example of when you translate literally word for word that you get some really strange translate translations. Of course, <coughs> if you translated that, the right translation would be, it, it rained heavily. That's what you need to say, it rained heavily. So you should never translate word for word. And secondly, that uh, being uh, intellectually honest, doesn't matter if it just confronts what I think the Buddha should say, I have to translate how the Buddha does say. So I have to get out of the way and not bend the truth to fit my preferences. That's why I was saying, I haven't mentioned that for quite a few years. So some people bend the truth to fit their religion. Others bend their religion. So no, bend the facts to fit their faith. Others bend their faith to fit the facts. So which are you going to do? <laughs> bend the facts to fit your idea of what Buddhism is? Or bend Buddhism to fit the facts? So anyway, obviously, we should prefer the second bend, the theory, to fit the facts. And so then we have the basics of the right mindfulness, the four focuses of mindfulness. And one of the most important parts of that, you know, well, when I wrote this down, instead of having the four foundations of mindfulness and so much repetition, I did one, two, three, four. Obvious. So, having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the body, experience, mind and mind objects. Energised, so you're not down. Whenever the five hindrances have been restrained, you are energised. Hopefully, that when you've had good meditation, Good, I mean, you know, when you feel the sort of, uh, you know, going well, you find you do have energy, energy, you are energized. You're awake, it feels good. You're energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing. Why are you practicing mindfulness? You are not practicing mindfulness like it's sometimes used in the military to make sure you can kill more people with a better aim. Sometimes, that, I know, saw that in a, in a bookshop, mindful shooting. 
with what's the purpose of what you're doing and are mindful. Knowing the purpose of what you're doing is Sampajanya, mindful sati. And uh, you've seen that before in the Anapana sati, so in the uh, sati patana, but you may have never seen a translation like that. It adds to your understanding of what's going on. So now we go to the mindfulness of the body. I went through this very briefly yesterday, but I'm just going to go through it briefly again here. This is the first part of mindfulness of the body, is mindfulness of breathing. It's a pretty good place, sit down comfortably and give priority to establishing mindfulness. Then mindfully you breathe in, mindfully you breathe out. Don't say where you breathe in, because mindfully you're aware you breathe in, you breathe out. And I never um, emphasised enough yesterday that if you don't have enough mindfulness to start off with, many people start watching the breath when they're not really ready for watching the breath. And then when they watch the breath, okay, I've got to watch the breath. And then after a few breaths, they, they, they're wandering all over the place simply because they did not do the preparation. So, now if you want to do breath meditation, it's on page 39, by the way. If you want to do a breath meditation, preparation is so important. I know you all want to get enlightened quickly. You know, there's only another few days left on this retreat. <laughs> but you, have to, you have to do it properly with uh, not cutting corners. So, you've, you're mindful, you're in the moment, you're here, you're energised, and as I was mentioning this morning, that <coughs> when you are mindful and energised, one of the great signs of that is you're happy. Everything tastes more delicious. The first meditation retreat I went to it was in Baden Street in Cambridge, the old Samatha Group, I think one of the first or second retreats. And we were hiring, not an incredibly beautiful retreat centre like this with great food. It was like uh, two or three boarding houses for students in a vacation. And so, as soon as I heard that, I thought, well, it would be great to go on a nine day retreat. And the rooms are uh, peaceful enough, but the big problem was the food. Boarding house cooks employed for students. Now all the best cooks and chefs were working in hotels or restaurants. The bottom of the pile would be those employed to look after poor students. So they weren't paid very much and I never expected very much either. I expected the standard food of England in those days. In the colleges we said proper chefs, meat and two veg. It didn't matter what vegetables it was, because they all tasted the same. <laughs> Any flavour had been totally boiled out. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they had to have gravy or ketchup or something, to give it some taste. So anyway, I wasn't looking forward to the food. And I was actually even thinking of getting sandwiches or sneaking something inside. But, I was so pleasantly surprised. The food was really tasty and delicious. And at first, I considered that it must be karma, luck, good fortune, that we managed to hit upon the one cook at student boarding houses who had some skill in culinary arts. But I realised many years afterwards that was not the case. It was nothing to do with the cook or the food. It was everything to do with me and a clear mind. The more peaceful I was, the deeper meditation, 
the more delicious the food was. And so if you're enjoying the food in Belsey Bridge, I hope the, uh, the cook never hears this, but it's more to do with your mindfulness and your peace than the cook. The more still you get, the more delicious the food. What happens? So anyway, whatever you experience, just when you are peaceful, becomes more delightful. So you breathe in, so if you piloty touch your mindfulness, of course it's easy to watch then, you're enjoying it. You're watching the breath. So when the in-breath and out-breath are long, you are aware that they are long. When the in-breath and out-breath are short, you're aware that they're short. Then you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. Then you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. First four steps. And unfortunately, just the way it says these things in Pali, it repeats so much. It goes something like this, just translating into the English. When you breathe in a long breath, you are aware it's a long breath. Breathing in a, no, breathing out a long breath, you know you're breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, you know you are breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, you know you're breathing out a short breath. And right, when you're in breath and out breath are long, you know it's long. When it's short, you know it's short. Because sometimes it gets so long, the repetition is just the idiom of Pali. You repeat anything six times, more times the better. So you don't. You don't say, I have to breathe in an in-breath, then I have to breathe in an out-breath. Oh my goodness, I haven't done the in-breath yet. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> of course you do an in-breath. You don't have to be in short breaths or long breaths, because I was wondering, so when I choose a short breath, what's a long breath? Because sometimes, most times, my breath was in the middle somewhere. It doesn't mention that. When in-breath and out-breath, the uh, middle. So I better cut out the middle breaths. And <laughs> all it really means is it gives you something to be aware of when you're breathing. And sometimes instead of just noticing whether it's long or short, you have these little mantras you can use. Breathing in peace, breathing out let go. You know that uh, in Thai Buddhism, forest tradition, I used to use the word buddho with the breath, breathing in, you say to yourself bud, breathing out to, buddho, buddho, which is a Thai word for the Buddha. And if you were into Thai Buddhism, that would have some really emotional meaning for you. So it would make it very easy to watch the breath. But sometimes when I, we tried that with Australians over in Perth, they just could it didn't resonate for them. Put her, put her, put her. So we have to keep the meaning, but you now change the words to make it more interesting for her. So the next one I tried to the Australians who were meditating, as you breathe in, say to yourself, shut, breathe out, up. <laughs> shut, up. <laughs> that didn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> Then we, then we tried something very really interesting, which was another um, mantra which they were using in Thailand. The mantra is just words you repeat to yourself. It was die near. And that meant, you know, you will die. That's for sure. And it's a bit too complex for with the breath. But if you're doing walking meditation, that is really cool. It works. So if you try a walking meditation in the hall, in the... What's the hall? Sorry? Suffolk. The Suffolk Hall. Not the Suffer Hall. <laughs> no. <laughs> in the Suffolk Hall. As you move your left foot, you can say to yourself, I will die. The right foot, that's for sure. 
I will die. That's for sure. And at first of all, you do think it's a joke. But I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. And of course, you realize it's no joke at all. And then after taking it seriously, you will come across fear. This is actually the most clear, truthful statement you've heard on this retreat. No doubt at all. I will die, that's for sure. You really come close to it. You, you get to know it. I will die. And you go through that fear. I will die, that's for sure. So all this stuff you carry around, it falls away from you. Why do you want to carry this around? You're going to die, that's for sure. You start to shed fears and attachments. Past and future become irrelevant. I will die, that's for sure. So after fear, you go through letting go a nice peace. It actually works, it's cool. I will die, that's for sure. Hey, I'm free, I don't have to worry about things. I will die, that's for sure. Woohoo! So it's not scary, it's actually liberating. So that's another one of doing it. Some people count the breath, or, but it's all part of the. You know, sometimes I prefer to teach um, breathing in peace, something positive, energy, freedom, health, whatever it is. Breathing out tumor, breathing out sickness, breathing out whatever you want to let go of, anxiety. Breathing in safety, breathing out fear, whatever it is. You, know, you custom make it to your condition. And always something positive coming in, and something so sort of negative, hurtful, harmful, a burden for you going out. But it's not just saying it, you've got to feel it, visualize it. What is peace for you? Visualize it. Remember peaceful times, silence, harmony, anything, balance, peace, whatever. Make a picture of it. Write an essay about it, as it were, and then breathe in it. <coughs> and breathing out sort of stress. Can you imagine those times of stress, really tight, sick? <laughs> breathe it out. So you feel it, not just say it. And then it's very effective. And even for people who do have things like this, really heavy sicknesses, breathe out the ease from the pain of arthritis. And breathe out the pain, the inflammation. Breathe in health. Breathe out. It does actually work. The mind has a huge effect on the body. Look, I say that being a budding scientist at Cambridge, we used to look at all sorts of interesting things. Hypnosis was one of them, and I'm sure many of you have seen experiments like this or something similar. I remember seeing this experiment. Of they took a, a, a person, a volunteer, put them under hypnosis, and they had a piece of wood with a four inch nail on the end. And under hypnosis, this fellow was convinced that the nail was red hot. It was a very, very high temperature. And they touched the skin on the arm of this young man with the um, the nail. It was at room temperature. A baby could touch it without being burnt, but he was convinced under hypnosis it was red hot. And he screamed in pain. I could understand that, the emotional response. But what really shocked me and opened the door to many, many other interesting ideas was when they touched the skin, a blister arose. 
there was a trauma, physical trauma on the arm. A burn happened. Belief created an injury. And of course, you inferred from that, if he could imagine belief, and I saw it with my own eyes, that it was red hot. It wasn't red hot, but he was convinced it was under hypnosis could injure the skin. Maybe the opposite could happen. You could have a red hot piece of um, I, uh, nail and convince him it was a room temperature. Then what would happen? Convince him that the tumour is shrinking. Then what would happen? Convince the person the arteries were clearing. Then what would happen? The mind is very powerful. We all know placebo effects, but why do they work? Anyway, so going back to it is connecting with the breath, the in breath and out breath, you get to know them. Now much of this is a natural process, it happens without you ordering it or telling it to proceed. Then you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. And monks, meditation teachers have arguments here. Does this mean watching the whole of the physical body? Because the word is watching the, the, uh, the whole of the kaya. And kaya can mean the physical body in some context. It can mean a body of evidence, a body of truth. Uh, it can be a body of mental concomitance, the manokaya. It can mean anything. The word kaya means a, an aggregation, a conglomeration of things. Even dhammakaya, the body of dhammas, of truths. So, that word kaya can mean many things in different contexts. So again, you have to translate sentences, not words. And so when you are free, you're doing your meditation. By this time, most of the body should have been relaxed enough to disappear. So anyone who writes, you experience the whole of the body as you breathe in and out, to me, that is untenable, illogical. The whole of the body? Even now you cannot experience the whole of the body. Can you experience your left ear up right now? Maybe to <coughs> not experience the knees. Feeling the sensations of the body can be disturbing. So actually what happens naturally, you're watching the breath go in, out, in, out, and as you become more peaceful, you see more of the in-breath, more of the out-breath. I'll give a little visual demonstration now. You, know, you can watch my finger, and I'm watching my finger, I see it go past. That's going, I've got to change here because you see things opposite. Going right, going left, right, left, like in, out, in, out. I just see it passing my eyes. But, as I become more observant, see it going left, and so going right for you. Going right, going left. I'm seeing all of the movement of my finger. So that the third part of the Anapanasati, the mindfulness of breath, is just seeing the whole of the movement of the breath, from beginning to the end. It happens naturally. So you're watching your breath go in and out, and more and more as you observe it, with your mindfulness, you see it from the very beginning, when the first bit of in-breath arises, grows in intensity 
And you can check this out for yourself. Is it like a side curve? It just goes up and then fades away. My breath always seems to go up and then it fades quite quickly as it finishes. Then the out breath is a pause. And then the breath goes out. And that too, um, it's almost, it goes up quickly and then goes very slowly and it peters out. It takes a very long time at the end for the last bit of our breath to be exhaled. And then there's another gap. That's watching the whole of the breath from beginning to end. And I'll give you a little test to make it interesting. Which is longer, generally speaking? The gap between the in-breath and the out-breath, or between the out-breath and the in-breath. Which pause is longest, generally? Doesn't really matter, the answer. It just gets you interested to watch the hold of the breath. Makes it a little bit more fascinating, so you can see every part of the breath, without giving any opportunity for thoughts, distractions to come in. Just watch your breath. Just like when you're doing the walking meditation, I hope you've tried doing some walking meditation in the other uh, ditch. Is that right? <laughs> Suffer, uh, something against that. The ditch is where we do the interviews. <laughs> so when you're doing the uh, walking meditation, again, after a while, it's not just left, right, left, right, left, right, like a soldier. Very beginning, with the foot moving, all the way up, and just you see every part of just one step. It's fascinating. I never thought that just one step could be so interesting. And you see the whole of it, the whole of the movement of the left step, the whole of the movement of the right step. You can see just how it matches with the natural watching the whole of the breath. And the fourth little stage here, you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. And the breath is called a Kaya Sankara. Sankara means you know, the will created uh, body creation. Even the body, the Buddha calls the breath the body. It's one of the bodies, it's part of the body. So you just calm it down. So should you force it to be calm? Come on, calm the breath down. Don't be in so much. You just get tight and tense again. It happens naturally. Reason why? Because you are, you are meditating. <coughs> you are not doing very much physically. You are inert. You, except for your, your lungs and your, and your heart, nothing else is really moving. But I think everybody realises that one of the huge consumers of energy is your brain. I think when I read the latest article, I think something like 30% of your energy which you consume is used by this big blob of grey matter inside the brain huge amounts of energy, disproportionate to its size. That's one of the reasons why when you stop thinking, when thinking calms down, you have a surfeit of energy. More energy, and that uses to recharge the mind. So, the more. So anyways, after you become peaceful, you're just watching your breath, you don't need so much breath. You don't need to metabolize so much. Okay, nice little anecdote again from Thailand. Ajahn Chah, he used to uh, not, not give the Western monks any breaks at all. The food was the same as the Thai people, it was disgusting. And worse, no mosquito nets, mosquito coils, or, or mosquito screens anywhere. And when 
we first formed what Nana tried. I was one of the first six monks there. There was no cooties. We'd sleep out on the, on the ground in the forest. We had mosquito net umbrellas. Must, we had those. It was really cool because you'd be laying down there when you were about to go to sleep and you'd see the little snakes still across. Mm. It was only just mosquito net, but somehow or other it gave you a sense of safety. You know, you know they wouldn't sort of come through the mosquito net. So it was fascinating. I'm sure these really venomous snakes just walk past, just flew up past you. But inside your mosquito net, you felt safe. Total delusion. But nevertheless, <laughs> really. <laughs> but then when it came to this, this new monastery, that Ajahn Chah would come every evening just to, you know, to encourage support. And every evening, he would come about six o'clock, we would do a little bit of chanting, and then we would meditate for two hours. Two hours as the sun went down in the jungles, in northeast Thailand. That was dinner time for the mosquitoes. And you had bare shoulders, bare arms, bare head. What I describe it as, more seats at the dinner table for the mosquitoes than a lay person. You have hair, you have more clothes on, and as a monk, I was not allowed to swap those mosquitoes. I thought many, many times that you could, uh, wanted to swap those mosquitoes, even though I was a monk. They were just really irritating. And I don't know why, those mosquitoes, they actually, they torture you, first of all. They're sadists. I'll tell you what I mean. First of all, they go to your ear. We're going to bite you. And then they bite you. Why don't just bite you and get on with it? Instead of telling you first of all. And then they knew if they saw a bald head in the brown robe that they were safe. They wouldn't be killed. Imagine. If you went for dinner somewhere, you didn't know where you'd get out alive. Number one, you'd have, for sure, irritable bowel syndrome. You wouldn't be able to enjoy your meal because you were so tense. You didn't know whether it was safe to eat. That was what those mosquitoes felt when they, they bit the skin of a lay person. And gone. You were taking a chance. Imagine how tense you would be. If you went in tomorrow morning for breakfast, you didn't know when you'd come out. Squash. <laughs> but when they saw Brown Rock, they said, ah, enjoy, feast. And number, next thing, was, I went to some places in Thailand where, let alone a monk, a Westerner had never been seen before. I remember going to one village on arms round, and as they were putting food in my bowl, the usual etiquette is not to look at the monk when you're putting food in the bowl. But I've never seen a white man before, let alone a monk. And so they're looking at me, <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the rice went outside the bowl. The dogs loved me. They had a feast that day. Because what fell on the floor, they, the, the, the dogs ate. And so it was one of the first times that we got into that part of Thailand. And so the, the, the mosquitoes knew that as well. Western food for the first time. Come on, my friends, say to all the other mosquitoes, Western food. You know, whenever they have a new delicacy, you know, in town, it becomes popular until after a while, it's just like any other food. So anyway, we got slaughtered by those mosquitoes. Two-hour meditation. Many times, first of all, you'd open your eyes, see a child just sitting there. All the time, I just wanted to run. Because with my friend, 
We used to count the mosquitoes on our arm. It was almost like a competition. It was, and we compare notes afterwards. You'd only get to about 60 or 70 at the same time, and you just could not um, resolve, you know, one from another. They just they almost had melted together. Just and so it was just intolerable. But when we complained to Ajahn Chah, he always said, "Call them Ajahn Mosquito, a teacher for you." And I didn't know what he meant, teacher. But what they actually did, mm, fantastic, thank you so much mosquitoes. Because I couldn't run away, I couldn't swap them, they were unendurable. So what you did, you just went inside. You went, so you're watching your breath, really relaxing, even though the mosquitoes were biting. You're watching your breath, and just get so full awareness of the breath from the very beginning to the very end of the breath. Because if your mind wandered, it will wander after the irritating mosquito biting. <coughs> so you went right from the beginning to the end of the breath, calming the breath down. And after a few minutes, you couldn't feel any mosquitoes at all. You were deep inside. And the weird thing was, but afterwards, you didn't feel any mosquito bites, you were meditating, having a wonderful time, and afterwards, I looked on my arms. Westerners, when they get bit by mosquitoes, always have these little bumps. The welts come up. There's no welts there at all. I said, wow, the other monks had welts, not me. The mosquitoes hadn't bitten me. And I thought, ah, psychic powers. Mm. The way you get some samadhi, you get a force field around you. And even the mosquitoes, they just try and find a way and they just can't. Well, it, it took me years to find out that that was not what was happening. Mm -hmm. Mosquitoes are attracted to the carbon dioxide. That's one of their attractions coming out of your skin. The more carbon dioxide comes out of your pores, the more they know there's a human being there. The more they know it's dinner time. But because I was, my metabolism went way down, there's hardly any was any carbon dioxide coming out at all. So it wasn't I had a force field, it was the mosquitoes couldn't find me. It became invisible to the mozzies. And I, from that I thought, isn't it interesting? The more we worry about getting bitten by mosquitoes, the more our metabolism goes up, the more we're attracting them. Come on, bite, here I am. The less you worry about them, the more peaceful you are, the more relaxed, the less you get bitten. Another case of what you fear the most, you make happen. When you subdue your fears and just relax, it doesn't happen at all. So that's when mosquitoes, they taught me how to let go, of, and just to let them focus on the breathing. I just go deep so they couldn't find me. Wonderful, thank you mosquitoes. They were imagine. So this is how you experience a hold the breath and how you calm the breath. When you calm the breath, mosquitoes don't find you. How do you do that? Just relax. It's one of the reasons why I try not to create any fear here. If you come in late, it doesn't matter, you're allowed to be late. If you fall asleep during the meditation, you start snoring, you're allowed to do that too. In the monastery, where I'm supposed to be the abbot, I'm only there sometime, not all the time, I don't know what's going on now, I hope it's okay. I told the monks to make sure you clean up before I get back. <laughs> but they're very good monks. But, the, one of the main rules I ask, of our monks, is you are allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to make mistakes. And then they don't make so many. It's obvious psychology. When you're afraid to make mistakes, oh, I'm going to get probably something get thrown out, you make more. So allow yourself to make mistakes. That's the best way of not making mistakes. So that's where you 
It's better to, to hold the breath as you breathe in and out. And it becomes peaceful. It's the breath coming in and going out. Now, just a simile. If you look at the original uh, Satipatthana or the Anapanasati, you'll see just like a skilled um, lathe operator knows a long pull or a short pull. And we did build a lathe to make some of the requisites for months when I was in Thailand. There was just no electricity, just bamboo, string and a couple of big nails. It was very effective. So I understand this simile, but many of you may have used an electric lathe, but this is the simile you find in the sutras. Is not appropriate. Instead, I was thinking, what's the same meaning which nearly everybody has done from time to time? Painting, painting a wall. So, just like a skilled painter is aware when they're making a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke, so too when the inverse is long, you are aware that it is long, when it is short, you know it's short. That was a simile which, and many others coming up uh, in this uh, Word of the Buddha class, the similes should keep their meaning but be changed to make them more relevant to today's world. So in this way, you're aware of your own body, aware that the bodies of others are the same as yours, same nature as yours, so you abide aware of the nature of both your own and other's bodies. Or that you are abide aware of what causes the arising of the body. You abide aware that the body will cease when the four, when the causes cease. Or you abide contemplation of body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. You may have been under the impression before, you're aware of arising and passing away. That is not what the words mean. It is said very clearly in the Satipatthana Samyutta. What does it mean by arising, or dying, and ceasing, atagamana? And it's said specifically, it refers to the causes why these things arise. Not just the experience of arising, but why? Where do these things arise from? And why they cease? As far as the body is concerned, it is the four nutrients. The four nutrients. Why body comes. And when any one of these four nutrients disappears, they, um, the body stuff vanishes. And if ever you want to see this, I'll just get the... It's from the Samyutta Nikaya, 42nd Sutta of the Satipatthana Samyutta. I will teach you the origination, Samudhya, and the passing away, Atagamana, of the four focuses of mindfulness. Supported by the four nutrients, there is the origination and continuance of the body. With the cessation of the four nutrients, the body ceases. And the four nutrients are food, they will also include things like water and air. The six sense contacts, will and consciousnesses. It's worthwhile just pausing there. Food, we understand. But six sense, con six sense contacts. If you ever see a person in a coma, it could be you know, your relation, your best friend, your lover or something, just keeping them on a drip is not enough. They need contact, physical contact, uh, verbal contact. 
So if you want to keep them alive, hold their hand, stroke them, talk to them. You may feel that they're not listening or they can't listen. A lot of times they can. But if you don't stimulate their five senses, then they will pass away. Because sensory stimulation from the five senses is part of the food, the nutriment, keeping a person going. Story that this woman, she, I didn't say the cause, but she was in a coma in hospital in Singapore. And, you know, she was basically gone. And she said, what brought her, obviously she came out of the coma eventually, what kept her going, what brought her out was the sound of like a, she said, a temple bell. Sound is one of the, the they call it a thorn to a jhana. It's what actually you can get into a deep coma or even death experience almost brings you out again. So that's sometimes one of the reasons why when people are trying to find out, you know, are you alive, are you dead? And they try and put a light in a person's eye, or often the by all the advances of technology, one of the clearest ways to find out if a person's alive is to shout in their ear hole. See so the reaction. And that's if someone's in a deep meditation and they're going to get out. Like I was saying the other day when I was uh, walking meditation and I had to go to a, a, an appointment the Mark actually came right into my ear hole and shouted at me. I could only just hear him. It's weird because in the sense it was shutting down. Blah, 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 so. And he was really shouting and I heard this. <laughs> weird but yeah, that's what happens. But anyway. The sound. So this, she said it was a temple bell pulling her out. But she was only halfway out because she could hear, feel, even see, but she couldn't speak. She couldn't respond. And she said with great drama, but I've got no doubt this actually happened, that she was uh, seeing her four sons talking with the specialist and the specialist was asking permission to turn off the life support. He said, your mother is gone, there's no possibility that she will regain consciousness. Can I have permission to turn off the life support? And she heard all of this. That's why it's a really dramatic story. You knew the ending because she was telling me this. <laughs> but it was fascinating. And she said that being Chinese family, the four sons, the three junior sons said, eldest son's responsibility. You have to make the decision. And he was complaining like anything. You can't leave this responsibility to me. This is our mother. This is life and death. If I say, turn off the machine, she's gone. Help, please. And the son said, no. Nope. It's your call. He was very upset with his three younger brothers. And mother was listening to this. And she was trying, I'm here! Don't turn the machine off, I'm still here! And obviously they couldn't hear her. So she realised she just had to use her willpower, just whatever telepathy she had to her son. Son, don't. And she was on this edge, her life or death was in the balance and she was listening to it and her son was making the call. You can imagine just the drama of that. And this was real. It wasn't just a sentence with an appeal possible. If he said turn off the machine, they would turn her off there and then and she'd be gone. And he thought for a few minutes, give her one more day, he said. Oh, thank you, son, thank you, son. That's what she thought, but 
he never knew that, the doctors never knew that, because she could hear and remember, but she couldn't do anything. And within that 24 hours, she could move her toe. Silent movement. So they never turned off the life support, and little by little, with a lot of effort, a lot of pain too, she actually regained all of her faculties over three or four years before she could walk again. But she told the story of what happens in a coma. And this was one of the reasons why, if you want the person to keep alive, stimulate their senses, talk to them. They can hear sometimes. If you don't, they'll just disappear. So that's one. Number two of the causes for the arising of a body, for maintenance. The next one is will. You can work, I don't know how many times I've seen people in the ICU or, you know, on their deathbed. They're supposed to be dying, 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 and they're waiting for some important person to come from overseas. Maybe their, their son comes in from New York, mum's dying, and the son comes in, says the last things to their mum, and then mum dies a couple of hours afterwards. And they just, they will themselves to keep going to finish off important stuff. And sometimes people give up the will to live. They decide they've had enough. Just giving up the will to live. Not even committing some suicide, but they just die. In other words, you also need the consciousness there. Otherwise, if the consciousness departs from the body, then you're dead. So interesting, just this is the subject of time, just on the causes. When those causes finish, so does the effect. So that was the um, the arising of Christ in the way uh, Back to page 39, it's two days that I haven't finished this page yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll mind, it's interesting stuff sometimes. Uh, of else mindfulness, what causes the body, what causes the disease, and its cause of nature. Of else mindfulness is just a body, impermanent, suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. There's your body, you can't maintain it forever. And there's some people once asked me, said, well, medicine, a knowledge of, of um, the decay. I think what was it mitochondria? When the cell divides, the mitochondria divide, and every time they divide, they are slightly impaired, just like anything else which is being used. It wears out. He said that was one of the main reasons. The the medical fraternity thought was for old age. And said, well, that could be stopped, maybe even reverse. Maybe old age is a thing of the past, maybe we can live forever. But that begs the question would you want to live forever? I'm not supposed to watch movies, but one movie I did watch, which was interesting, was Groundhog Day. <laughs> where the person kept on, it was right, the reason I watched it, because they said, this is really interesting for your Dharma talks. The person just woke up the same morning, again and again and again. And interesting, the psychology, he was immortal. And after a while, he just got so fed up with being immortal, he tried to commit suicide in all these really interesting ways. He'd just you know, drive a car off a cliff. He'd drive a car in front of a train. He blow himself up, but every time he committed suicide he woke up again, sort of the morning of the same day. Like Samsara. You live, you die, and you get reborn again. <laughs> I collect some really weird stories. There was this there's been a few cases of people, babies when they're born been able to speak. 
I've collected some of them. And so these are not made up stories. Baby comes out of the womb, or in the first days of life they can speak. Not in baby voice, but in adult voice. But this case is my favourite. In a maternity ward in a US hospital, the baby came out of the womb, still attached to the umbilical cord, in front of the midwives or the doctors, I forget who was there, but many people saw this, came out, looked around, and said the clear words in English, Oh no, not again. <laughs> It remembered what life is more, <laughs> more nappies. You think you're finished with school? <laughs> All over again, getting a job, finding a partner, losing a partner. Oh, All again, you think you're retired? Here we go again. <laughs> But, would you really want to live forever? One of the movies I saw as a kid, it was um, a Dracula movie. Oh, okay, time. This talk sometimes goes on forever too. <laughs> <laughs> and I forget the name of the director, but it was not just a, you know, sort of blood and guts scare you out of your cinema seats full of Dracula movie. He was described as the thinking person's Dracula. Because it was similar, this vampire uh, who could only feed on blood, but was immortal. The only way that Dracula could be killed, could die, was being caught out outside in the sun. The rays of the sun hit his body he would die. He would already been going for about 500, 600 years and he basically had enough. Been there, done that, everything. What more is there to do in life? But he was terrified of death. So he was stuck between knowing how easy it was to die, just walk outside of his cave or just stay another day and another day he could live forever. And there was that tension between having enough of life and wanting, being afraid of death. And of course, in the end, he allowed himself to be tempted outside where he died. He couldn't stand another day. Bored, do I've been there, done that. And I first saw that when I was a student, and later on of course, a more popular version, Groundhog Day. If you were immortal, that would be some of the biggest suffering. You'd really go cuckoo, <laughs> bananas, waking up another day. What for? So that's one of the reasons why that this, we, this body, you want it to be forever? Thank goodness it's impermanent. Suffering after a while, pains, pains, being there, done there, before. And it's not me, it doesn't actually, it's not who you are. And it doesn't belong to you either. Who does your body belong to? Sometimes nature, that's all. So it's going to get old, it's going to get fat, or thin. It's not my problem, it doesn't belong to me. <laughs> sometimes I tell people, it's, it's not my body. You know, sometimes you tell me it's time to finish now, it's time to go on a, a course, eat this, drink that. So, you know, you feed me. I never buy my food or go to the shop to get it. So you feed me, so this is your fault, not me. <laughs> 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 Not me, not mine, not a permanent essence. And we go on to more things not being permanent essence. My word for our soul. Soul carries baggage. 
essence. Ok, c'est quoi? Because when I was in first time I went to Cambridge studying science, I was taking around the Cavendish laboratory. And you were shown all this, this amazing old building. You met a place where J.J. Thompson found the electron. A place where Alan Rutherford, the New Zealand scientist, split the atom. And this was no high tech. It was done like with elastic bands and pieces of silver foil and, and that sort of stuff. So innovative. But anyway, where Rutherford split the atom, the atom was a Greek word for indivisible. The fundamental, permanent, unbreakable stuff of the universe, an atom. It wasn't supposed to be split. But many years before that, an Indian gentleman under the Bodhi tree, split the Atma, the Self, and found out there's nothing there. Atom, Atma. There's a connection there. The material, fundamental building block of matter. The Atma or Atta in Pali, the individual essence, undivisible, imbreakable, permanent, what people think they're made of. Connection. Rutherford was brilliant, but the Buddha got there first. <laughs> so Seven. Oh, yeah, seven minutes of meditation. Oh, we've got two hours here.